First of all, I'd like to use this occasion to express my thanks to the Australian New Zealand donors who in the hard times or early days when we were just beginning to take off, who helped us so much. People have uh, their own personal stories of how they got involved with, whether it's disabled people or other marginalised people. For me it was purely accidental that I got involved working with uh, disabled people. I went to Korea in 1957, just a couple of years after the Korean War. Like most Columbus at the time, I was involved in parochial work. That was the all our ministry in Korea is uh, working in parishes. So I worked in a parish for 24 years. And it was during my time in Gwangju city, which has a population of about 1.2 million people, that I became involved with the Mudong Institute, at that time known as the Beggar's Camp. Here in about half a an acre, there were about 600 marginalised people of all ailments. You had psychiatric patients, you had orphans, you had homeless people, you had physically disabled people and you had intellectually disabled people. And you were all living in overcrowded, about 30, to a room, but they were the forgotten ones. And so I began to kind of hear the call. One day I was in the parish, the phone rang, from, from Teresa, a volunteer at this institution, and she, uh, she said that Yoa, an 18-year-old intellectually disabled, was hospitalised. So I rushed to the hospital and Teresa was there holding Yoa's hand, and Yoa just looked up at me with her beautiful smile and her blue eyes, and she just uttered one word, which means thank you, and breathed her last. Since Yoa had no family or no one belonged to her, they were going to use her, her corpse as a you know, for study for the medical students. So I, when I heard that, I said, no way. So we took on the, the responsibility we, of the funeral and the funeral expenses, so we set up a grave, we bought a grave out in the Catholic graveyard and we put up a tombstone and on that tombstone there is, will you forgive society, will you forgive the church, for too long have we ignored you. So in 1981, it was the International Year of the Disabled, I approached our Archbishop and our Columbus Superior and they gave me permission to begin a new apostolate with the intellectually disabled. With the help of the parishioners that I had known, I was able to get this rented two-storey house and uh, I invited a 20 plus intellectually disabled people and some volunteers. But at night time then I began to have visitors. Visitors were the parents of intellectually disabled people. You know in the gospel story where Nicodemus, he was, he was ashamed to visit Jesus during the daytime, he came at night. The reason that they came at night was because the disabled child, that child had been locked away in the back room. The extended family never knew that they existed. I've seen them in cages since 1981. The reason poor parents to see was because of the influence of shamanism, Confucianism and Buddhism. You see, according to shamanism, it's intellectually disabled or any disability is not a biological problem. It's a question of spiritual, evil spirit. The only way to get rid of it was to have a Buddha, to have a to see this would be a, driving out the spirits, the evil spirit, so to come back. And in fact, 
this while this is a ritual, you have other ones where uh, I have known where they have beaten to death uh, an intellectually disabled and they attempt to make the normal. It's because this was their belief. Then this is Buddha himself. One of the doctrines of Buddhism is that the reincarnation why they have disability is the reason because in the previous existence they did some bad things so they're being punished now and that's why they have the disability. And he is himself Confucius. Now Confucius was the man that the man of learning, the scholar. Confucius said there are only two people, those who are wise and those who are stupid who cannot be changed. So in this Korean Confucian society, they're fiddly fiddly who's who, the wise and the stupid who cannot be changed. So you can imagine then why the parents came at night. Because this is the society in 1981, there was never disabled people out in community living. So mine was the first community living, community based services in Korea. For social role valorization is to enhance the dignity of the intellectually disabled. So that one thing would be first the residence where they lived. These are the homes, you know, where they where they live. They just go to the local doctor, the local dentist, the local supermarket, the local post office, the local bank. Mm. So there's interaction and the people because they have been interacting with other people all of the years, their whole, their whole attitudes are changing. Mm -hmm. eh? The other thing is where they work. Contribution is to, uh, to work. Mm? So that man there, he's working, that's open employment, an ordinary factory. And that person beside him, we have what you call job coaches that go out and sit beside them to help them. But we try to get one of the co-workers to teach the, them the skill to learn. That's an exhibition. Yeah. They'd have an exhibition in some of the cultural places right down in the middle of the city. And people would come to just to have a look, you know. And they, they made it themselves. We'd, we'd have a cultural night. They're performing the, the tea, traditional tea. And they're playing the traditional flute back there. That's another part of the cultural night where they're putting on a, a play. The people that I live with, uh, they don't ask me whether you're Australian or you're, whether you're Irish or Korean. They don't ask you whether you're a Catholic or a Christian or a Buddhist. They only ask you one thing, do you love me? You come out for a meal, you come bowling, you come for a walk, It's the fundamental question of the gospel. Do you love me? And as I say, that's the answer that I'm trying to show to our people of their mouth.